Sorry, so it's loud. <laughs> Uh, the time being 7.03 p.m. on Tuesday, December 14th, 2021, I call to order the public meeting of the Rentham School Committee. My name is Veronica Gonzalez and I'm the chair of the Rentham School Committee. We're hosting this meeting in person in the Raymond Library of the Roderick L. Nope, we're not. We are not. We are in the Vogel School. <laughs> uh, we're hosting this meeting in person. Per state mandate, everyone in attendance is required to wear a mask over their nose and mouth. The meeting is being live streamed on the district's YouTube channel and recorded. This recording will be posted on the district's website. All right. Our first order of business tonight is public comment. Obviously, we have a large turnout of community members present tonight, so I'd like to just reiterate that public comment is intended to offer citizens an opportunity to express their opinion on issues of school committee business for up to three minutes. Public comment is not a discussion, a debate, or a dialogue between community members and the school committee. People wishing to speak will be recognized and then can take our podium. And when you do come up, please state your name and address before speaking. Could I have a show of hands if somebody would like to make a public comment? Alyssa LaPlante? It's Alyssa, right? Sorry, yes, please come. You're the first hand I saw. <laughs> <laughs> right over to the podium, you can see your name, your address, and you'll have three minutes to speak. Parent of two students at the Rentham Public School, the 
that decided to share what I believe with you tonight. Hopefully you can respect my opinion just as I do yours, but I'm not offended if you don't. Thank you. Would anybody else like to make a public comment? Please. Hello, my name is Rebecca Weber and I am on 170 Hickory Road in Redford. I've expressed my concerns on masking young children at previous meetings and would like to start off by saying thank you. Thank you, for your taking, thank you for taking the time to listen to what we had to say and addressing our concerns, as it's not always the case at local meetings. Additionally, though I am sure most of you have already come to this meeting with a decision in your head, please open heartedly listen to what is being said. We are not a group of anti-maskers, rather a group of parents who still believe that the choice of what happens with our children shouldn't be mandated by their school or government. In national school rankings, Massachusetts has been significantly present in top of that list. That means that what we were doing for students was working. Therefore, what we should be seeking to restore education back to pre-pandemic normal immediately. Adding additional obstacles for these children is going to do nothing but create an abundance of caution that will continue to harm our children. Our schools used to be about no children left behind, and sadly, that doesn't seem to be the case. Children have enough to learn without also having to learn how to read facial cues without seeing faces, learning speech while hearing words mumbled through a mask and without the visual of spoken words, clearly reading words without their glasses fogging up, and trying to decipher missed social cues that will have lasting effects on their development. We are doing them a disservice by adding an additional obstacle to hurdle when masks are not required for children under five in the state, so why would them? There are plenty of other states who do not require masks for, their, for any of their students and are thriving. So in, a world, so in the words of our own local horse man, let us not be content to wait and see what will happen, but give us the determination to make the right things happen. Unmask our children and restore education back to people in the world. Thank you. Yes, in the back. Good evening, my name is Narada and I live at 574 Desert Street. <clears throat> As a parent of two children, normally at Redwood Top Elementary, I oppose mandating masks for children. I believe parents should decide with personal consideration of risks versus benefits what measures are supportive of their children's health and well-being. We all want the safest environment for our children, but like most things, there is no one right way. Therefore, we must and should each have the right to do what we feel is the best, most appropriate action based on current Mandate strip parents of that fundamental right. I have multiple references available for what I'm sharing. My point is not to convince you, but to show that there is sound evidence against the use of masks and that therefore, as the matter is not settled, the decision must rest with parents. My research did not convince me that mask pros outweigh cons. I found that as masks have only a 3% ability to prevent the emission of small particles, they have limited impact on lowering transmission. Evidence suggests masks are not only ineffective, but harmful. Bacteria and other debris accumulate on the mask, forcing the wearer to read through, read through this variable petri dish, leading to a much higher rate of respiratory infection due to moisture retention, reuse, and poor filtration. Masks also cause harm resulting from stress. Kids learn to recognize friends from foe in seeing a full uncovered face, instantly forming spontaneous impressions that are beyond conscious control. The amygdala, the fear and survival center of the brain, codes trustworthiness when a face is clearly visible. But if a child's face is covered and he sees only covered faces, there's a twofold effect on the nervous system. The amygdala signals the body to remain vigilant. This will happen regardless of how we try to normalize masks, leading to heightened feelings of stress and anxiety, both emotionally and physiologically. Keeping children in a chronic state of stress well documented to have ill effects on immune function. Those with anxiety have significantly weaker natural killer cell activity. Further, stressed individuals breathe more shallowly and often through the mouth, reducing oxygen intake and signaling inflammatory immune cells to react excessively. This is a 
especially dangerous in a given virus and anxiety after obesity is the second biggest risk factor for serious outcomes. This is the greatest social experiment in the history of mankind and our children are the test subjects. Our decisions today will irreparably impact the future. We must act rationally, not through a lens of fear. We are faced with many unknowns, but that's always been the condition of life. We just can't know what effects will be seen in the future, so it is imperative that parents make the decisions for their kids. We'll never all agree, but we can honor others' conclusions and let them honor ours. Rentham Public Health recommends masking, but as intelligent parents can come to different conclusions and are the ones in a position to love and prioritize their children's well-being, where a committee is not, we urge you to uphold parental rights. If this committee decides to mandate masks for preschoolers, there must be quantifiable justification and the mandate should not be extended past January 15th without clear, preset, and concrete markers as to why and for exactly how long they wish the end date to be extended. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we just did not catch your last name. Was it Meredith? Oh, I'm sorry. Or last Thank you. Another public comment? Yes. Hi, it's Larry Green, and uh, my address is 45 Green Bank Drive. So, as we all know, um, Rentham Board of Health and Department of Health recently recommended masks for ages 2 and above. This is consistent with CDC and American Academy of Pediatric Guidance. Um, personally speaking, I have two kids currently in the school system, one on the way. Last month, our four-year-old was in the preschool program at Dr. Blossom, was diagnosed with COVID. Subsequently, our seven-year-old and nine-month-old were also diagnosed with COVID. Um, fortunately, their symptoms were mild, totally fine, but needless to say, it was a very stressful, it's a scary time for our entire family, extended family, and so on and so forth. Um, Medical experts have done medical research and determined that masks are effective in preventing the spread of this. Um, requiring masks for ages two and above is one small step that can be taken to at least slightly decrease the risk that we face. Um, and uh, I, I would uh, urge a unanimous vote to require the masks for kids ages two. Thank you. Would anybody else like to make a public comment? I was on the front here. That's, yep, in the front. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Krista Anberg. I live at 207 Franklin Street. Um, I am a parent of a, a three billing school students, one in Project Blossom, one in second, second grade in kindergarten. And I would just like to vote, I think, basically say that I, I know that all the teachers and all of you here on the school committee, your parents, yourself, and I understand that you have the best things in mind for our children as well as your own children, and they've always been paramount. And so I want to just echo what a lot of folks have already said, is that I don't think anyone here is going to doubt that we don't care about our children. But we do have to look at it through a broader lens. I hear a lot of people saying pre-pandemic times and lots of fear mongering, but the bottom line is we're not in a pre-pandemic time, we're in a pandemic. And the unfortunate beauty of it is that as a human race, we haven't gone through an epidemic never before. And if we look back a hundred years, we know that science has continued to grow, it's continued to be, um, more and more information sharing about what works and what doesn't work. And masks have always worked. They don't take away all the risks. They never will, but they are another layer of protection. And we have to look at a risk approach here. We're talking about hypothetical problems down the line for speech and language development. But the problem right now is that our children are at risk of being exposed to a potentially fatal virus. 
And that's what we have to be looking at, or that's what at least I look at as a parent. We have to prioritize what our risks are for right now. So I would just like to say my support for the committee to vote to mandate masks for my child, who is a four-year-old, as well as the other members of Project Blossom. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, in the back of the hat. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Joseph Garofalo, resident here in Redlands. I'm actually a little embarrassed to be here because I feel like you will think that masks do anything besides cause harm to children. The medical, the uh, New England Journal of Medicine has been very clear about it. They do very little to stop anything except the baby problem. This is a mass or a talent. We know there's significant damage that happens to children who are forced to either comfortable, horrible, unable to read mass coverings in your face. If you would do any research, you would find out there's no justification for forcing young children to go the whole day with these stupid masks in their face. I, I'm so sad that so many of you have been see. We're in a war right now. It has nothing to do with COVID. Has COVID been isolated? Raise your hand if you think COVID has never been isolated. Okay, so we agree. COVID has never been isolated. Let me ask this question. If COVID has been isolated, how is there a vaccine? You have to do some research. I'm ashamed of all of you. There's some of you I'm not ashamed of, but most of you are totally ashamed of you. You would do this to your children. You've turned this wonderful school into a sausage factory. Shame on you. Thank you. Yes. Lisa O'Brien, I work at 80 Parents Anonymous. School board members, good evening. On behalf of many concerned parents, I'm here to request data. The data that's been removed from the district website data that has led to this potential masking for the two to five year old preschool kids. The kids were at basically a zero risk for statistically young children. And now this new variant, which is a much milder variant, has a zero death rate. Um, and so it's, this is a backwards move. Uh, why is this information not available to parents who choose and pay to send their children to the school? Wearing a mask is a medical decision. Medical decisions that should be based on data and not fear or emotion. It should be a parent's choice, and I know no parent actually wants their kids wearing the masks all day long. So let the parents assume that risk for their own kids. It's my understanding that those requesting this mandate, which is not even a state mandate, are either unaware of the data or not using the data logically. Where, where is the data by which you're making medical decisions for our kids? Mass.gov states that children five and under are exempt from the masking requirements, and there is a logical reason for that. If the state can read the data and says that they should be exempt, shouldn't you too? If the teachers are wearing their own masks and they are vaccinated and they trust in those masks and their vaccines, why do we need to cover up our babies' faces? Why risk the safety and development of these kids because we cannot simply look at the data and logic? The risk to these kids wearing these masks outweighs the benefits because the kids really are not at risk. Have you considered the data of other respiratory viruses due to the breeding grounds they are improperly wearing on their faces all day long? They're constantly touching them. I've had teachers telling me the kids are having them in their mouths half the time, they're biting them. They're just, they're not clean. Just doesn't make sense. Simply put, we're just requesting the data that used to be available. If five kids in the same class tested positive two weeks ago, did the teachers also test positive? What were the circumstances? Were they all from school exposure? Or were they due to exposure elsewhere? Were the kids symptomatic? Have any of those kids been hospitalized or died? I know the answer is no on that one, but you have to ask. Have there been any preschool cases since? Where, just where is the data? When a school district places mandates, the facts must be kept by the administration and shared with the parents. What is the school committee's plan to address the lack of COVID information available to families? 
The facts are vital for us to make logical, informed, and most importantly, data-based decisions. If you have the data, we'd like to see how it supports the mandate. If you do not have the data, is it even remotely responsible to make a ruling today? Who should we follow up with to get this information? Oh, I have some more. Um, this is not related to COVID. But when my kid, when it's 22 degrees in the morning and my kid has a coat on the bus, and it comes to school and it's 50 degrees at recess, but has to keep wearing the coat, she says it's hot as heck outside. Why do they have to wear this? That's just bothering me. Thank you. Yes. Julie Garland, 555 West Street. I am totally here to seek a support of that mandate. In light of Massachusetts rising COVID cases, it makes sense to me to require children who do not be vaccinated, but can catch and share COVID with their family members who may be compromised with their neighbors who may be compromised, to ask them to wear masks and do so. Uh, I support the board will vote to mandate that, and I hope that this will continue with Thank you. Thank you. Back. Hi. <laughs> My name is Judy Hawaii, and I'm at one fifty. Forest Grove residents. It wasn't going to speak, but it feels helpful. So when the internet became a daily part of our lives, we struggled. Some wanted it, some did not. Some teachers wanted it, some did not. Change is not always welcome or wanted, but we can manage it. The pandemic is here. Six hours a day, some of us are masked to protect our children, to protect the vaccinated people, and the unvaccinated. We have, and I am proud of my colleagues for doing that. Um, Maps are not easy, but it is the recommendation from the expected. Thank you. Thank you. Um, please 
Um, so they gave me an out and said there was 13 a math student and 68 math students for a total of 81. Later in the meeting, I only gave a total of 68 students, so I wanted to have numbers for math. There's another eight point of speech about 68, and did that take three weeks? Um, I thought the meeting was kind of rushed at the end, the board had to give up Zoom link. There was lots of families for questions, so I'm surprised they actually made a decision instead of asking us to reconvene, request all the request more data to request the answer. Some of these things were brought up 17. Um, before we get into the next kind of right there. Um, just a couple of points on parents are paying for the program, the children's program are the program in the restaurant. Parents want to make their child have a choice. Not to take the toy food from other parents. Um, like you mentioned, not to just want to protect people's right to choose for the whole healthy and good and making their own agent community. Um, our state policy for the SCA EDC read that it is five bucks for the boys who are with SC and EDC. Um, we're going to take to education, considering the education part of the health part of the talking about this. Um, there could be a lot of reasons why these 13 children are on mass, whether it be medical behavior, parents picking their battles, and if you know, this happen. Uh, other personal reasons, um, we know what's best. You know, we don't know what, what, why that parent chose that and they truly feel like it can be the best choice for their child. Um, not all children are the same. Um, of the 13, some of them are going to have exceptions, so they can be doing that. Um, some of them are going to have COVID, so probably they're probably immune. So I'm really curious how many students I'm actually talking about. Seven, five, um, who are talking about this one meeting for. Katie, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yep, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I had a letter to follow up, but I was pretty much done. Um, thank you for I'm looking for a free discussion about the moment. Thank you. Last name, Bath. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Hello, my name is Heather Townsend. I'm at Eight Inch Mr. Drive. Good evening. As some of you know, I'm a microbiologist, college professor, and a mom of five here in town. One of my children is a preschooler here at Blaney. Last week I spoke in front of the Board of Health meeting about the science that unequivocally supports the wearing of masks as a primary mitigation strategy in schools by all staff and students regardless of vaccination status. Although I'm happy to speak to anyone who missed my statement or has questions after tonight's meeting, right now I'd like to switch and focus on a matter of connection, respect, and support to the very people who risk and give it all for our kids, the teachers. I'm here in support of the school committee to accept the recommendation of math and preschoolers here at Brentwood Public Schools. I believe it is in the best interest of not only our children, but especially the teachers that are requesting them. Many surrounding districts, including our neighbors in Plainville and North Oak, have made masks mandatory for their preschoolers. Their unions have asked for a mask mandate, as did our teachers' union last week. Looking back at the last almost two years, Teachers have been the foundation that held us up during this pandemic. They were the reason our children were able to have a semblance of a normal school life last year and this year, and why some of us could still continue to work through all of this. They pick our children up and ensure their happiness in a time when they need it most. They continue to ensure their safety in this very uncertain situation. So I ask you to do this for them. It is well known that there is a national teacher shortage. They're overworked, underpaid, and put in the profession at alarming rate rates because they just can't do it anymore. 
They're tired and they need our support. So it is our responsibility now to repay them with this simple request. I cannot wait for the day that we can all put these masks away for good. I swear, I cannot wait. But if wearing masks prevents a child, a teacher, or staff member from spreading this virus, then I feel for the greater good of all that we should do our part to protect them. Making teachers feel safe right now should be one of our main priorities. In closing, I hope the school committee accepts the recommendations of the Center for Disease Control, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the local Board of Health to have children under the age of five wear masks at schools. I support even more the teachers that are asking this of us. Thank you. Would anybody else like to make a public comment? Thank you. Hi there. Uh, my name is Joe Stewart, and I live at uh, 65 Hickory Road. And I'm here to ask you to do whatever you can to keep our kids uh, in the classroom to keep our teachers healthy, as the previous speaker said. Uh, what we don't want is we don't want the kids isolated in remote homeschooling situations. We don't want that. So you need to mandate masks, do it. You need to mandate vaccinations for everybody, do it. Whatever you got to do. Got to do to keep the kids in the classroom. That's what we want. Thank you. I'm sorry, Joe. Could I just get your last name? Stewart. Stewart. Thank you. It was Joe. Uh, Stewart. Thank you. Would anybody else like to make a public comment? I'm just going to, speak to talk. Um, my name is Mary Shell. I'm in Rentham. I've had two kids go through this system. I'm a nurse, and I was previously working at a school. This is the proper way to touch your mask. <laughs> OSHA did change their standards, and uh, they conveniently changed it recently for the mask uh, and for this situation that we've had here. Um, no one's using the masks correctly. You cannot touch. Everyone's touching them. And then you have little kids who are grabbing at it. They're moist. We do see mask induced respiratory infection a lot. So it, it is not, this situation is not without that situation. They're warm and moist, and the little kids, they, they, it, nobody, and I was, I was working in school, and nobody uses the mask correctly. Everybody touches the front. You are introducing bacteria. This is what you're doing. It is, they're not being used correctly. The masks are not being used correctly. Okay. So, spotting autonomy cannot and should not be ignored by people in elected positions here to serve the people who place them in these seats. You must allow parents to decide on an individual basis what is best for their own children. You can certainly strongly recommend, as the Rentham Board of Health did, that children be masked. But we believe you are infringing on our personal rights and our freedom by mandating this. At the start of this pandemic, over 21 months ago, we wore masks to protect the elderly and immune compromised until the numbers dropped. Now, those at risk populations are vaccinated and boosted, and you are considering masking up the cases of three and four year olds. This is not only unethical, it is cruel, an overreaction, and un American. These mandates, based on fear, have got to stop. We must concern ourselves with vaccinating, masking, and protecting our own families 
as each one of us sees fit. Thank you. Would anybody else like to make a public comment? Yep, in the back. I'm Donald Trammell, 382 South Street. I'm also an educator here at the National Public School. I couldn't be prouder to be part of this community, both as a public here and a public here. One thing that is for sure, you will never be the group of people who work here that wants to be more. They put everything into their day, their night, their weekend, everything. And if a mask keeps one kid from getting COVID, one adult from getting COVID, why are we not going in? We all deserve to be here, we need to be safe, and we can take this every day. Trust us to do what we can to make sure that they stay healthy. Because when you see a kid go out of COVID, it breaks your heart. It makes you feel like it's your only kid. And you pray that they come back. And I don't ever want to be the one to say, your friend is the one to get back Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to make a public comment? Hi, um, Kathy Anthony, 85 Panama Avenue in Renton. I don't have any notes as I wasn't really planning on talking today, but um, I have to agree with the last speaker with his math that this saves one kid from getting COVID and being sick. To me, it's worth it. But to address other arguments I've heard is you're taking away our freedoms and not having that. Well, um, unfortunately, that's not quite the way freedoms work in America. I'm not going to explain constitutional law right now, but basically what the school committee has to do is figure out, is this a rational, reasonable thing to do? And is it been recommended by the public Board of Public Health. This is what you should do. You should protect your students. If you're an elementary school parent, you've probably been getting texts and emails every day. Three kids in the lane, two kids at Rogers, like multiple times a day. So you can't say, oh, it's not affecting kids at all. It's here, it's affecting kids. Something's got to be done. And to address another comment, <laughs> coronavirus has existed. It's just another, uh, I forget what you another strain of corona that started in 2019. So the reason the vaccine was so quick is because corona had been, they've been working on coronavirus vaccine for years and they were now ready to try it out. So that's just my two cents on that. But at the end of the day, um, the school committee has been given a recommendation. What they're trying to do is make it so no one has to keep wearing masks. The sooner we Wear a mask, take care of this, the sooner we're done, and masks will be thrown away forever. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Let's put more stringent you know, demands on it. It's not 
helping. It's not changing anything. It's only allowing these little little kids that are trying to learn how to read, how to write, how to establish their phonics, how to communicate. I mean, really think about it. You're talking about putting a mask on the floor where these children's faces are so tiny, and you're covering most of their face, and they're trying to learn how to speak correctly. This just doesn't make any sense at all. This is an education facility. This is not a health facility. We should, our number one thing should be educating these children. I'm not worried about what the teacher's doing really wants. Come on, guys. Anybody who wants to can be guys. You can be triple white people boosted by now. Go do it and leave the kids alone. Now, I ask the school committee if you do choose to mask the youngest, would you please tonight? Put an end date and come back and revisit it. Don't just say we're masking the kids forever. Give us an end date. Say, we'll try it for a week, too. We'll see how many of these kids are touching their masks, making a mess of them, spitting, sneezing on a brush in the middle of the cold and blue season as well. These houses are disgusting. They're going to be really gross on the three and four months. We can't let them leave in the stuff all day long. It just, you know, my, my only request. Whatever you choose to do, please choose an end date and a revisit date. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to make a public comment? My name is Lauren. I live at 125 William Street in West Baton. My grandkids, one of them, is still in Frederick Public School. He's in fourth grade. Uh, I just want to make a comment to say that I'm full support of the school committee today um, and getting down to support and to decide. Uh, I listened to the meeting in August and I heard you guys make a you know, really sound kind of discussion over whether or not to be a name now. And at the time, I recall really the main argument being that there were no recommendations um, from our local Board of Health um, mandating masks for that age group, and then we did not have a mandate from Delhi to also mandate. That has changed. Um, you now have the Brentham Board of Health, who is has physicians and their board, um, who have recommended that you mandate masks for ages two and five. You have your American Academy of Pediatrics keep all of our children safe by their recommendation. We've got to see all made up of medical professionals and scientists. There are very few of us in this room who are qualified to make a recommendation or qualified to think about scientific evidence and scientific data and the way that it needs to be evaluated in order to make that re recommendation. And so you have all of those people who spend their days coming up with those recommendations based off of evidence-based practice, randomized controlled studies, um, that is what they do. And they've all made the recommendation. So I understand there are, obviously, you guys are in a terrible position, and I don't want to see what you do. And I'm thankful that you spent your time um, kind of taking into account that all of that information. Um, so again, just want to say I'm in full support of what keeps our give teachers safe and make them feel safe. I'm in support of the work that we do every day to keep our children safe. Um, and thanks for your time in evaluating all of them. Thank you. Would anybody else like to make public comment in the back? Good evening, my name is Sunita Stockton. I am not a resident of Brentham, although I feel like it. I have been with here for 25 years. Um, I am an ESL teacher, and I have the fortunate opportunity to be in classrooms pre-K through 6, and have been doing so for the last 14 years. This is not an easy issue. I think any time you deal with children, whether they're 28 or they're two, you want what's best for them. 
I have worked with these administrators, I have worked with these teachers, and I've had the amazing opportunity to work with these preschool teachers. And I will tell you, these preschool teachers and their paraprofessionals are one of the kind. They are amazing. They know your children. They take time to grow with your children. They cry with your children. They cheer with your children. They lose sleep over your children. And they come in day in and day out. I'm sure the first thing on my mind is not how can I keep these masks on these children today? I know for a fact it's not. But having been in all of these grades, I will tell you these teachers have done a phenomenal job to make this as less of a priority in that that's not where your child is focused. Your child is focused on learning how to be kind. Your child is focused on looking in the book with their friend, learning how to share the cups. They can't wait to sit at the table with their friends for snack. They're learning how to do the developmental things they need to be learning. Is it an optimum situation? No. COVID is not an optimum situation. But I just want you to know that these preschool teachers and their paraprofessionals who work in them are giving you everything they've got. And they put your child first every single day. I can't tell you whether wearing a mask is the best thing or not. That's not my forte. You want to learn how to speak English? You want to learn an academic English? You want to learn how to read? Come talk to me. I'm pretty decent about that. And I worked hard at it. But there are people who are specialists in their field. And they're giving us advice. And we're trying to do the best that we can. Our nursing staff, I worked in other districts. I worked in other countries. And I worked in other states. I've been here for 25 years for a lot of reasons. So please understand that whatever decision gets made tonight, it is not an attack on anybody's rights. It's because they care, we care. We lose sleep. But our preschool teachers and our nursing staff, we're pretty lucky. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to make a public comment? Going once, going twice. Okay, thank you all. Okay, we're going to move on to approving our meeting minutes from the regular session and the executive session uh, meetings from November. 16th, 2021. Make a motion to approve the regular session minutes. Second. Second. We'll take Phil and Gray as a second. Uh, we'll do, we won't do roll call, we'll just do all in favor. Aye. Aye. And all those opposed? And any abstentions? Great. Thank you. Make a motion to approve the executive session meeting minutes. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? <coughs> and abstain? Great. Thank you. Uh, next up, new business. Madam Chair, through you, I recommend that we move up the review of the mask based covering policy to discuss that as item one since we have a lot of people who are interested in that topic. Sure. Um, no one wants to stay for the global update? <laughs> <laughs> I think Chad and my party went. <laughs> They're all experiencing the global update. <laughs> So um, to, just for, for some context, we, the state uh, the, over the summer made a mask mandate for requiring everybody age five and older in a school building to wear a mask over their nose and mouth. And they strongly encouraged but did not mandate masks for uh, children under five. 
and you all grappled with that at your meeting in August, uh, which is unusual uh, for school committees. When I, I did a survey prior to this meeting asking superintendents to let me know where they, what they did for their preschool students, I heard back from 85 districts, including Plainville and Norfolk. Uh, of the 85, 66 said that they require masks universally following the CDC guidance. Um, and 19, including us, uh, did not. And at the time, you had this, the recommendation from the CDC and, and you had the uh, guidance from the state. And the guidance from the state wasn't a mandate. And you deliberated over that. You consulted with local board of health who felt that having it be optional was appropriate based on the COVID infection rates in the town at the time and the spread of COVID in the school. And we've had that in place since the start of school. And we've reviewed it. You gave me the directive to include this on your agendas going forward at every meeting so that you have opportunity to revisit the issue. And at the time you said that you would, I believe the term was like snap back into masks if they became, if, if it was necessary to keep the community safe. And fortunately, it was not that we were able to maintain the policy through the start of the school year. And I'll share with you some of the, the numbers that we have. In September, in the district, we had two cases, uh, two students, uh, one in third grade, one in kindergarten. In October, we had three student cases, uh, two in fourth grade and one in second grade. So things were going well. And when we met for the November meeting, things were still moving along okay. Um, as the month moved on, we got into Thanksgiving, it's when things started to pick up. Uh, November, we had 15 student cases and four staff. And uh, we had one sixth grade student, two fifth grade, one fourth, two in third, three in second, one in first, zero in kindergarten, five in kindergarten, and four among staff members. Pre-K, excuse me, pre-K, pardon me, pre-K. And that was concerning. The class with the five students happened within a two-week period, and they were all in the same class, uh, and there were 15 students in the class. That registered with me as a concern, as, a, as an increase in infection that warranted a revisit by the Board of Health. I contacted the Board of Health to ask them to reconsider based on this trend, knowing that they're the local medical experts, we are not, and relying on them to give us their, their opinion. Uh, we met with them, well, you and I met with them, at their, at their they had an uh, additional meeting scheduled only for this topic last Monday. And at that meeting, they deliberated over the issue, recognizing that this is a contentious issue in the community, as you heard lots of different opinions, wanting to do exactly what I said at that meeting, balance the fact that it's not a mandate from the state, that it's a recommendation, along with the realities of the virus in the district. Based on that, after consideration, they voted unanimously to recommend that you change your policy to have all children two, two and up masks that could align with the CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics. So that's the recommendation of policy. Since then, we have continued to see a spike in cases. Up through today, we have 11 sixth graders, three fifth graders, uh, two fourth, one and third, two in second, one in, uh, excuse me, four in first grade, five in kindergarten, two in pre-kindergarten, and two staff cases. So they're not limited to pre-K, they're not limited there, they're certainly throughout the district, but that trend is that the virus is in the district. We don't know whether the virus is spreading in the district or not. We don't think that it is being transmitted, particularly in the upper grades uh, within the school, because we have the, the masks in place and we're following we're monitoring where the students sit and being able to close contact them. So we think we're able to 
contain the spread, which is good. Unfortunately, the students are coming to school and we're identifying them through test and stay, so we know that they are coming to school with the virus. Um, so the trend is still uh, continuing in the district, although pre-K, fortunately, it's only been two new cases um, since the Board of Health meeting. So just as a, as a percentage, so you get a sense of where we are with the students, uh, from September until December, we've had 50 student cases, uh, six staff member cases. Uh, so in sixth grade, 12 out of 121 students are a little bit less than 10% of students that tested positive. Uh, five cases out of 126 in fifth grade, about 4%. Five cases out of 135 students in fourth grade, so about three and a half, three point seven percent Four cases out of 108 students in third grade, again, also about 3.7%. Six cases out of 108 students in second grade, five and a half percent. Five cases out of 121 students in first grade, four percent. Six cases out of 129 students in kindergarten, 4.7%. Seven students out of 83, in pre-K, uh, 8.4%. Um, that gets us to six and six staff cases, which is about uh, 3%. So uh, that's where we are uh, with the situation currently and with the recommendation from the Board of Health. As I recommended at your, at your August meeting, I, I recommend that you uh, take the uh, medical advice closest to the district, that is the Board of Health. And I recommend that you vote to change your policy to align with the Board of Health recommendation and require master students age two and up. Thank you for the data. Sure. So um, the data that you, the, the case data that you uh, discussed, just because I want to make sure that we reflect, this is information that is sent out by email. And yes. then is it also posted to the website? Was there a change to the information that was posted to the website? I don't know. I'll check with uh, Director of Technology, Sean Hearn. I don't know. I, our primary way of communicating out the information is through a, a daily email or a, whatever the cases come up in email, which has been daily since uh, right around Thanksgiving. But I, but I will check with Director of Technology to make sure that we have that information posted on the website because I agree that should be a repository for the data. So I will make sure that if that's not there now, that it will be. I also just, um, so I uh, was not a participant in the Board of Health meeting, but I did listen in. Um, and um, I, you know, I, I believe, you know, a lot of the things that were discussed tonight were discussed by the, the three member board, including the two positions, and weighing the different sort of benefits and uh, detriments of mask wearing. Um, and uh, I believe that in addition to the recommendation for the uh, changing the policy to mandate masks, there was a time horizon to do it for as short a period of time as possible. Um, so I think we should consider as a board um, that we maybe get to see everybody every month. Um, but that we continue to ask the Board of Health for updates based on the community spread. Uh, for those of you who did not listen to the August meeting, we did have a very long discussion about this. We had two meetings, actually, I think, um, because of some communication challenges. Um, and one of the things that, um, you know, I think was, was uh, you know, something that we talked about was that we, we did want to, um, uh, that the Department of Public Health said that the, they were weighing the risks based on statewide data and that there was a different calculation for two to five year olds than for kids of uh, two, two, three, and four year olds than for five and, five and up. But that that would change at, as local conditions require. So uh, the local conditions, I think, are critical. And given, obviously, the sort of strong interests um, in the, the topic, which I think is what Brian would here tonight. Um, I would recommend that as part of any policy that we uh, vote on tonight, that we would have it enforced until our next school committee meeting and that we would uh, request a, uh, an update from the Board of Health on a recommendation prior to that meeting, if that's feasible. Well, I think that's great. Um, I, put, I put amended language in your proposed language in your packet regarding um, which uh, because of our paper shortage, uh, <laughs> allow, me to, allow me to read it to you. Oh, 
So that wouldn't really change the policy that we have in place of the idea of revisiting every single school committee. Exactly. Yeah, it it it. We've had it we've had this as, right, right. every month. We've had this as a topic, um, yeah. as old business to rediscuss at every, every meeting, meeting anyway. since the, we made the initial you're asking for the board I'm asking for the board of health to weigh in. To weigh in. Right, that's the change. Yeah. And I assume they meet monthly. They do. Is it updated after the call sex on? Say again? Is it updated after the call sex? Uh yeah. Trying to track on it. Let me go here. Hang on. Do you want the language to say specifically that you want the Board of Health to meet? I mean, we can't enforce the Board of Health to meet. I know, but right. I think we make a request for updated guidance before it starts for a reasonable period of time for the information prior to you. All right, here we go. This is the proposed policy for that side uh, your packets here. Okay, a lot of this is, is consistent with what it was before. Uh, the Rentham Public School District is committed to providing a safe environment as schools reopen during the COVID-19 pandemic, according to public health experts. One of the best ways to stop the spread of the coronavirus and keep members of the school community safe is the use of masks or face coverings. Therefore, in accordance with guidance from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, the Massachusetts Department of Elementary, excuse me, Early Education and Care, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, the following requirements are in place until further notice. A mask covering that covers the nose and mouth must be worn by all individuals age two and older in school buildings and on school transportation. Students' families will provide students with masks, face coverings. Staff members may use their own face masks or those provided by the district. And then it goes through talking about what the face mask looks like. Face mask covering can be disposable or reusable and will need to fully cover the nose and mouth and secure to the chin. Be made with at least two layers of breathable material, fit snugly but comfortably around the side of the face, and be secured with ties or ear loops. Based on guidance from health authorities, neck gaiters, open chin triangle, bandanas, and face coverings containing valves, mesh materials, or holes of any kind will not be considered appropriate masks. If a staff member or a student does not have a mask, they'll be provided with a mask by the school district. Individuals may be excused from the requirement for the following list of reasons per CDC guidance. The individual has trouble breathing, is unconscious, is capacitated, cannot remove the mask or face covering without assistance. In addition, masks, face coverings will not be required for anyone who has a medical or behavioral challenge, making it unsafe to wear a face mask or face covering. A written note from a physician is required for a requested exemption. Additionally, additionally face masks and coverings will not be required when appropriate social distancing is enforced, like during a mask break, when eating or drinking, during physical education class and while outside. If students are in violation of this policy, the building principal will consult with the parent or guardian to determine whether an exception is appropriate. The student may be removed from the school building until such a time as they can comply with the requirement or the requirement is lifted. Violations of this policy by staff will be handled in the same manner as other violations of school treaty policy. Visitors in violation of this policy will be denied entry to the school district facility. The policy will remain in place until rescinded by the school. So that's what's there right now. Any other comments? Or any comments? No, are we gonna just vote? <clears throat> or would you like, would you rather that we 
give reasoning behind our votes? I mean, does the public need to, or do we? Uh, I just want to open the floor for our board to sure. have a discussion if we would like to discuss. Basically, I think we have, a, you know, a few things have changed since we initially met in September and we made the optional mandate, for, if that's a mandate. And the changes are for the recommendation from the Board of Health and the number of cases um, in our school. And the recommendation from the position of the school district. Correct. Oh, yes, I didn't mention Dr. Giuliano. Yes, Dr. Giuliano, the district's right. uh, position also recommends, uh, he concurs with the Board of Health. I personally have nothing to add to that. Are we good? Yeah. I make a motion to approve making a change to the current policy to mandate masks for two and up. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? No. Any abstentions? Okay. I believe we passed with a four to one vote. All right. Um, and this is also to say that we will revisit this again in January uh, as we have on our uh, old business that we will be rediscussing. So we'll keep that as a line item on our future agendas. Correct. And I will uh, consult with the Board of Health when the infection rates go down. I will uh, reach out to them if they don't reach out to me so we can get an updated opinion on the mass recommendation. And as soon as we have that, I'll, I'll, well, I'll meet with the Board of Health at a public meeting to discuss that. And then once I get their updated recommendation, I'll bring it to all of you as soon as I can so that you can vote to um, amend. When this is effective immediately. So I will, um, now tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow's be a little bit of race period, but, but um, yeah, so I'll send the notice out tomorrow and the WPS update uh, with the information and um, you know, is it tomorrow, is it technically in place tomorrow, but you know, we understand we'll be working tomorrow. Yeah, so we'll, we, we can, we can, Tomorrow will be a push day, and then we'll get it rolling on Thursday. OK. Thank you. All right. Let's do I just would, I guess I think I just want to say also, this is not a decision we come to lightly, as I hope that everybody here can see that we, we do take our duty as your representatives um, heavily. And we don't come to these decisions lightly, carefully. We don't discuss or deliberate outside of public hearing. Um, we're not allowed to. So what you see is what's happening right now, right here. And um, it's as hard for all of us as parents and community members as it is for all of you to come up and speak. So those of you who are leaving, if you were speaking, I'd just like to say thank you also for sharing your opinion. Okay. Of course. Yes. You know what? Yeah. Okay. Uh, school committee will take a five minute recess. All right. So, next item of business. Uh, three, Madam Chair. FY22 budget update. We have. Um, Business manager Shannon Shepard is going to talk a little bit about um, the money that you need to vote to accept, which is great, and then uh, talk about the grants a little bit. Okay, can I pull it anywhere out? Yes. Whatever you want. The floor is yours. So I actually want to start just with the general budget update first. So a little second and a quick piece of The last time we discussed getting the grant lines in and then making some journal entries and check first and then picking the encumbrances. That was done for the 
special ed <coughs> 40, the early childhood grant, and Title One grant. We just got the SR2 number in, and we won't even use SR3 as of yet, so we don't have to worry about transferring that. Um, so the next update you'll see will have some SR2 funds that have some transfers, but for the most part, we've made a lot of progress in getting encumbrances corrected and the journal entry done. We have roughly $700,000 left for the year. Um, part of that is special ed tuition. We won't cover that money until we use our allotment for second grade. So I would say that's going to be probably $100,000 for the day. Other than that, I don't see anything that, that is of concern. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, oh, and one more thing to add, the fund balances, they should be in, I would say, by the end of this week. The auditors of the town are in all this week finishing up, and once they are done, then we'll have our fund balances confirmed. So that is rollover money from last year in all of our revolving accounts. So if you are looking at this, if you're looking at, like, let's say, the gifts or the facilities account, you see all these negative numbers. We don't really put a budget in there because they don't have budgets. But what you use is your fund balance plus your revenue minus your expenses. Right now, we don't have any of that in there because we have to wait for those numbers to be fine. Once they are, we're good. But I do keep track of it on the side, so none of them are actually in this. So then the next piece that I'm going to be going to. Last time we were asked what is like the total number of grants we've gotten, so I just included this is from the state website. Uh, the R grant to the American Rescue Plan, we have early childhood, and we have the regular ed. The homeless children and youth, we did not get that. In order to get that, you had to have a certain minimum number. And even if you were to go as a collaborative type of group with Plainville, North Oak, and all that, we still wouldn't reach the minimum number that you had to get. So right now, we're not getting that additional $1,163 per population. The early childhood grant, that's the only one we just talked about, that is a salary. SR grant, those are paying for some of our additional mental health that we got. Those are the ones that we talked about where we can do powers instead of having to be initially in order to do that, but we need the powers so that we can have to use the ARF. And then your regular IPA grants, um, we pay our, our professional staff and we pay our ESY staff of those. Same thing with the Title I grants, we pay a para. And then we do with some different types of professional development. Um, the new American Rescue Plan, I think, is the one you guys asked me about the last time. So we are doing a transition to kindergarten. Is that what you're looking at? Mm -hmm. um, transition to kindergarten, as well as some other programming related needs for our students. So do you have any questions about it? I don't. Do Great. No, I don't like it. Thank you. I like it. <laughs> okay, next one. This is going to require a vote. So when we came back with our budget, we came back with a 3.3. It was actually 3.33. <laughs> More money for us. <laughs> That's how we can get there. So in order to correct our budget line and uh, take additional funds, I am asking is that you go to $3,473 and I would like to put it into the software acquisition line. And I will tell you why I would like that line. Uh, we have a special ed program called Teach Town that we implemented last year during the week. We use grant money for this and it's rather pricey. Um, and we have put it into one of the American Rescue Plans this year. But eventually that money ends, so we would run into funding. So if we start now by putting that additional money, it's not taking away from anything, because we 
didn't realize we had it. Mm -hmm. We can start putting part of the money on this year and then use a little bit of the American Rescue Plan next year to pay for it by adding a little bit more and then a little bit more. So we don't need that money. So I think that's probably the most responsible way for us to keep a really vital program that our special ed department has really benefited. Do you know what the cost is? It's, yeah, it's in your sorry. packet. It's uh, three thousand. Well, that's a Oh, sorry. It's actually there's there are two programs. One is a social skills program that we use both at the lower elementary and the upper elementary grade. Um, so that we renew every year, and that may be about a thousand dollars. But then the, there's a Teach Town more than ADA based program, and that's a per student cost. So I think it's something like $150, 200 per student. Okay. And again, but the game was free during COVID, sure. and everybody <laughs> loved it, sure. and now they want it. So, right. And it is really beneficial for the kids. They get it um, helps to track the data on the progress, and so it's been very helpful. Um, it's very time consuming for mm -hmm. the staff, so they can be working with kids and taking data. So um, the teachers really ask that we have it, but 16 or 17, I can't remember exactly what the program is, but it, it's been very beneficial. That's a good question. So it's not going to be that much more that we're going to have to add over the next few right. years. It's going to be like five hundred dollars. So okay. Get there. Yep. But that way, it's not like we have a small budget. So asking like to let let's put five thousand dollars and like that's you notice that. Right. Right. Are you requesting a vote on this tonight? Yes. Yes. Yeah, because I actually have to do have to get this number back to the town so they can put it in our appropriate budget line. Can I make that motion? Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? And abstain? We're good. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Thanks, Shannon. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you. Out. Yep. All right. So we're looping back, I think, now, right? Yes. Now it's my contract extension. Okay, so we did the masks, we did the budget update, and so we're at. <laughs> um, okay, so as a committee, uh, we discussed a new contract with Superintendent Cameron um, during our executive session last month in November. Uh, the contract would start on July 1st of 2022 and run for six years. Um, the salary increase for the first three years would be 2%, 2.77, and then 3%, and that is pretty much average for a state. Um, and then, let's see, we would negotiate the salary terms for the remaining contract period prior to June 30th of 2025. Um, we all were able to discuss this in executive session, and we caught you up. <laughs> uh, so it's pretty straight. It's really very straightforward. Um, and I think, is there any further discussion that we need or any questions that we might have? OK. No, um, I think we we'll bring it to a vote since I, for the most part, we were all incredibly excited that Dr. Cameron wanted to stay and lock in. Yes. I, I would like to make a motion to approve the new contract for Superintendent Alan Cameron before he changes his mind. Yes. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? And any abstentions? Thank you very much. I, I love it here. I'm really excited to. Um, actually, it's interesting because I remember Eric when I first interviewed here, you were worried. I watched the video. You didn't say this to me. I watched the video. And you said you're worried that I was just using this as a stepping stone. Huh? Yeah, and um, I'm very proud today to be able to, you know, to have you here you know, since you were here at the beginning yep. to see how. You know, I, wrong. I, yeah, I love, I love <laughs> you. Here, and, uh, not the first to be happy. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, I'm glad you did. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's, you know, it's a great forever. place, great people, and you know, I could not sure anybody better. Great students, great colleagues. Uh, it will be wonderful. So, uh, thank you. We're very lucky to have you. Awesome. All right, good, let's move on. Yep. <laughs> All right, okay, good, superintendent's uh, report. So, uh, first up, plan for allowing visitors to the school. So, uh, we discussed this a little bit last week. Um, we understand that getting parents in the schools is something that everybody wants. Uh, the, you know, teachers who 
you know, not all teachers have parents in their rooms, but the ones who do are eager to have them back. And we know that it's also, uh, you know, a lot of the families want to get in there too. So, uh, in the return to school plan, we stated that we were starting the year with no visitors because we wanted to see what would happen. And uh, unfortunately, what's happened now is that, is that the virus is spiking. Um, so what we had written in the plan and what we're, what we're still doing is we're going to uh, see how things go through the December break. Um, I met with the Faculty Senate, uh, which is a group of, of uh, representative group of all staff members to talk about this issue. Um, they're collecting feedback from their members. We're going to discuss that at the meeting um, in December and uh, get a sense of where they are with having visitors back. And then um, we get to January after the, after the break, I'm hoping that we'll have a, an ebb in the infection rate. And um, you know, when that happens, what I'll do is similar to with the masks, I'll go to the Board of Health and I'm gonna just check with them and see, is this a reasonable time to allow visitors back in? And if they give us a green light, then um, we will. And I'll just caveat that by saying that of course it's still teacher discretion. Not all teachers have uh, parents in and some may not feel comfortable even once we give the green light. Um, but I'm hopeful that we'll be able to get, in, get them back in there sooner than, than later. And I'll update you again um, in January, uh, once I hear, after I talk to the faculty senate about it and get their feedback um, at the meeting of December. Is there a first um, step of what you would start allowing for visitors? Would it be like um, a chaperone on a field trip or a, yes. a book? Or Great a question. Okay. Yeah, so it would definitely be small. So it might be just what you said. It might be a chaperone on a field trip or it might be a parent visitor in the help of the class or, or someone helping to, to put books back on the library shelves or help in the office. Small individual mm -hmm. things and okay. then we'll build up to larger. Yep. And I hope by the, by the time weather gets a little warmer, we'll be able to have full, uh, you know, class events. Right. Alan, do we have any indication on an average day how many parent visitors there could be. I mean, are we talking dozens? Are we talking a small handful? I defer to the principals. Depends on the time of year. This time of year usually it's much busier. Sure. Because it's a whole, like holiday celebration and things like that. Uh, normal time of year, if, you know, winter or spring. If at Roderick, it's less than Delaney, we, we might have a handful, you know, three to five on a day. Yeah, not, 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 not a ton, no, and even over here, I think the biggest issue is in the library. Mm -hmm. Like classes have a set time that they go to the library, and in technology, sometimes both buildings or some of the specialists have had parents like yeah. volunteer when their child has a special just for next year. Yeah, I used to do. That, yeah. yeah, like a week. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that's a common one. Otherwise, occasionally book groups and things like that in classrooms, but not yeah. a ton, even over here, part of the time. I'd love to see that come back first. Yeah, I think we all would. And those are the things that'll come back first, will be those kind of individual yeah. uh, experiences. Mm -hmm. um, so. Oh, yeah. Have you have so I know this is a sensitive question that would need a lot of discussion, but the way that we ask uh, visitors or chaperones to have a quarry, would mm -hmm. we potentially ask for proof of vaccination? That's a sensitive question that would require more <laughs> conversation. I, I don't. I don't. I don't have an answer to that. That I, I. I don't know. I'd have to. Because as a parent, I would wonder how I would personally feel, especially when masks will no longer be mandated. Yeah. Knowing that potentially there is someone from outside the school community coming in. To, I mean, school community as a parent or as a chaperone. I get it. But I would like to know personally. I understand, but I also, not all of our teachers are vaccinated. We have staff who are not vaccinated. So it's not, we don't have a max a vaccine mandate. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's not, we would still have, I mean, in the foreseeable time now, we would still have, I would imagine we'll probably not have a, a vaccine mandate requirement. And unless you all decide that you want one. And then, um, but, but, but they would still need to follow the, the current mask guidance. So they would mm -hmm. still have to be masked. No, I de I'm definitely not at all interesting, interested in talking about mask mandates. That's personally not something that I feel. We need to talk about it. <laughs> you said mask. Oh, I'm losing my mind. But, but I, I would at some point like to discuss in the future, or at least yeah. plan to see that it's something that's on my mind. Well, of, of visitors and proof of vaccination. I hear you. And if it's on your minds, it's on other minds too. And I think it's important to vet all opinions. 
So probably when we're getting close to the time when it can happen, so maybe the, that January meeting might be the time for that conversation to happen. Um, depending on what's happening with the virus, it might be February, you know, because I'm going to want to get the, the approval from the, the green light from the Board of Health uh, prior to it. So once I get that, then we can come back here and you can, you can talk you. about that. But I anticipate it being, like I said, probably January, February, somewhere in there, I would think we'll start small. And um, are there, I know the third grade just went on their field trips. Um, are there other field trips planned? I would defer to the principals. Should the fifth grade is going to the Museum of Science plan or, or planning to go to the Museum of Science uh, in early March. Okay. Thank you. That's okay. <laughs> wait, wait and see. Yep, that's exactly, exactly. Great. All right, next up, uh, Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum Instruction, Dr. Boshane, is going to loop back to answer some of your questions from the uh, MCAS presentation. She's done some research and has, has some answers. Yes, so uh, thank you for sparing a few minutes tonight. Uh, back in October, we shared um, the data regarding the percentage of students in the aggregate in very small groups uh, in the meet and exceed category. And then we had two questions uh, that came up. The first said, is it the statewide trend to the female male disparity in the exceeding expectations category, as well as when we were looking at the performance of female and male students in the meets and exceeds category? So that's something that we've had uh, coupled together for years because that's what shows the proficiency level. Um, and we did find some interesting trends when we looked at the meets and exceeds. We showed that there is a consistent trend in grades three, four, five, and six in ELA, where the percentage of female students in the meets or exceeds categories um, was greater than the percentage of male students in those same categories. So that was an interesting trend. When we go to solely uh, exceeding expectations category, the trend looks different. So there is a slight uh, difference in positive direction with the percentage of female students over uh, male students in the exceeds category in DLA, but it's minimal, virtually not measurable, um, with one exception in grade four. Uh, but that was a random exception, not a state exception. And I would caution us once again, our sample size is quite small. It's under 100 for both uh, female and male. So uh, you really don't want to um, have too, too big of a leap there. Um, the other interesting point in when you're looking just as exceeds, uh, the percentage of female and male is pretty, uh, pretty equal throughout there, with the exception of um, ELA in grade four, where uh, there was a 12 percentage point difference with female percentages over males, and then uh, the flip in grade five science was exactly the same, a 12 point uh, difference there. So uh, interesting to note, not something that we can really make programmatic decisions on, uh, but we'll be watching and monitoring that. So any questions about that? Okay. Um, the other question that came up is why are the school and district scores different for grades three and four when we only have one school for grade? So uh, I had a wonderful conversation with my friends at the Impact Service Center, and they shared that because we had um, children in grades three and four who attended out of district programs, their scores on the MCAS vault were included in the district score, but they do not attend our school, Delaney or Roderick, so their program is not in the schools. So, a uh, very simple answer uh, for an enigmatic question, but um, I'm glad that we got to the bottom of that. So, any other questions about that? None from me. We, we'll have bigger sample sizes next year due to sort of the, uh, the, the administration, given the the uh, COVID uh, protocols last year, is that right? Or? Slightly, um, but we were ranging between, you know, mid 120s and mid 130s, so um, slightly. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Vanessa. Right. Thanks, Vanessa. <clears throat> okay, next up, uh, I feel bad we've had <laughs> these two special guests waiting. Uh, throughout the meeting. Um, three special guests, including Sarah, thank you. Um, 
Okay, so I'm very happy to uh, bring uh, Chad Lovett up first. Chad is uh, a joint employee. He works for both the uh, town side and the school side, and he's in charge of uh, capital projects, and he has been doing I mean, amazing things. I don't know if you noticed the, the green, the, the common in town. Mm. I mean, it looks amazing. Chad was, Chad was it looks fantastic. Fantastic. the first to put that together. It truly looks amazing. It really does. Um, and so he um, he works with uh, department heads to find out you know what the capital needs are in, in town and works to kind of prioritize those and find out the feasibility of, of you know working to improve them. And Vogel Vogel School, where we are right now, is something that's been on the to-do list for the school department for uh, years predating me. Um, and so Chad spearheaded a uh, outside group to come in and do a full assessment. And he's here tonight to share some of those findings with us. They will, be, but yeah, they're still on the break. They're coming back. That's why I'm here, Chad. That's right. Thanks for Serve many generations of commitment of students beginning in 1935 and some of The evaluation of identified issues and the bill for the necessity of evidence by the many leaks. <laughs> yes. Um, Behold. Yeah. Bill building envelope, including broad uh, floors and windows, image gunners and metal spots, cracks, interior, masonry, and other exterior. We will manage several of the interior positions throughout the building, ceilings. Mechanical systems are old and not efficient. One of the boilers has a slow water leak, requires a heavy arm and a lot of this to leak the water because of the force. Safety systems in the buildings, they don't meet any of the today's standards. The balcony is huge, the rail is too low, the metal exit stairways to the rear of the building is too high to maintain. There's little in the building that meets current accessibility requirements. There's no elevator, there's no way to get up, it's a way to the stage and it's up. So, what does that all mean? To bring the building to today's standards within the existing spaces, cost estimates are one point three million dollars. This does not include changes to any classroom sizes, including for repairs and upgrades to the existing footprint. This work isn't something that's currently the town's capital plan. I'm hoping that tonight's conversation will start further discussions about the needs of this building and its future plans. Yeah, so I, uh, Lori scanned it and shared the uh, document. It's, it's very comprehensive and goes through all of the things that Chad just outlined. And Chad, of course, has uh, firsthand experience because his office is actually downstairs in the basement. Oh, no. So uh, in, the dry, in the dry section, not, not the science lab, but the dry section. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So he knows firsthand um, some of the, the challenges of the building. So I, I wanted to. I had Chad come tonight because I wanted to kind of give you a sense of the scope of the situation and the fact that any money that we're spending here on the building is really just a slow decline um, because we still need the space. We still use this. This is the only auditorium in the district. We have all the perimeter offices are used and, and we have um, in classrooms. And like I said, Chad's downstairs. So it is still important space that we can't just mothball the building. However, there is a horizon at which point it's gonna be either not cost effective or not even possible to continue to sustain the building. So we don't, I don't expect us to have any answers tonight or, or um, you know, brainstorm ideas for the space. Rather, I'm just hoping to, to hear from Chad what, what the scope of the problems are, the fact that the town is not, does not have it on its to-do list to, to, to invest the 11.3 million in the building, and that we are going to need to work with the town to find a solution for, for the building. What is a typical sort of capital request that comes through in a given decade? I don't know, in a, you know what's a, what is a comparable sort of experience when other departments 
uh, have capital needs. There hasn't been, I haven't had a lot of data on the capital plan. When I came in, it was a five-year capital plan, a lot of vehicle items. We went through what we call alpha, uh, did building assessments and everything. We're starting to push that into the capital plan in uh, uh, front of the finance committee in the spring. Do you know, like a like the police and fire? There's like, nothing comparable. <laughs> nothing comparable. I mean, not even the ABW buildings are comparable. No, that's true. Maybe nobody's a great conversation. Maybe not from that buildings. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I know that, that, that building is, it's, that building really needs to be replaced. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But like, like police and fire, what is, like, what is something like that cost? Today, yeah. police and fire station probably be 80,000. Wow. Uh, I haven't priced it out. Like, <laughs> but, you know, like a fire truck, a yeah. ladder truck, kind of yeah. thing. She would somewhere in Lane and a half. Okay. I'm not sure if I answered the question. You did. Right. Thank you. So what's going to happen over the over the time um, is we're going to I'm going to be bringing more ideas to, to you all to, to kind of think about and discuss as we try to find a way to manage our existing structure here and the reality of the space needs that we have. So um, stay tuned. And uh, expenses like this are. Are always sort of completely municipal based. There's no state funds. Oh, that's a great question. Um, not not for a building like this. Um, we did do a roof project at Delaney that was we partnered with the Massachusetts Association of School Building School Building Authority. Excuse me, and uh, they picked up almost half of the cost of the project. So there is that resource. They won't. There are. It's a difficult. It's tough, it's tough to get on their list. And you have to work, we have to work with the town to do that. And they won't spend money on a fixing up a building like this. So that's, but they might, who knows, they might, we might be able to pursue some other avenues to see if they can partner with us to solve the problem. Thanks, Chad. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chad. Thanks. And thank you for the comment. It looks great. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, we've got Glenn Gillespie. Glenn is the facilities manager here in the district. So he sort of has a comparable role to Chad, but he focuses only on uh, building issues in the district. And I've asked Glenn to come tonight to talk about our other major uh, capital issue, and that is Roderick School. Roderick is one of our main learning spaces, and it has a number of issues. <laughs> Take it away, go ahead. Just a little background on the Roderick. It was built in 1968, the original building. The original building was around the cafeteria. Twelve classrooms there. Two classrooms in the front lobby and the office. Right. In 1998, the O'Connell went That house was 11 classrooms, a library, a big tech lab, and a couple small classes. So we have the finished master components in our building. So we have 1968 HVAC system. Still runs, still works, but it's in 1968. We're going to run the same process we're running here. We don't start addressing the position. The other crop is windows and doors. Very poor condition, especially in the 90s, 1996. They're rotted. We are replacing doors as they go. The window is single plane, probably not even safe to keep in them. Uh, very breezy, very cold, so unefficient. So we have um, we had a couple of capital projects to uh, look into. One was the HVAC for about 360,000 bucks. And the doors, windows for the whole school is we figure roughly about 700,000 bucks. And some of that could be funded through the MSPC. Mm -hmm. They would pay for that if we call them. We want to stop this process now. We have done some upgrades that hasn't been fully low changes from 2005. We had uh, three condensing boilers installed. 2008, the roof was redone. So those are structurally sound, but the building definitely needs to be kept up better in the future. And 
I think we're in front of the town and Chad it would be a great asset for us to get out of the door and get funds to the school. So what we're going to, thank you, Glenn. What we're going to try and do is see if there's a way that we can maybe work with MSBA to solve both problems. Um, I'll work with Chad and Glenn and Kevin Sweet, the town administrator, and see what we can come up with, and then I'll loop back with all of you. And this isn't going to be an easy fix or a quick no, fix, but right. over the next few years, we're hoping to get that squared away. Thank you. Any questions? Thanks, Glenn. No, thank you, Glenn. <laughs> You're good. Uh, right? You're I, good. I do have one, just one question. <laughs> So, uh, Glenn, first of all, thank, thank the both of you for uh, talking to me a few times this, uh, for the last six months as well about some of the needs there. Um, sadly, the, uh, the infrastructure bill of the past did not include the $100 billion that had been snuck in there for schools. It got snuck right back out. This often happens in the horse trading, so I don't see that happening. But I did notice that at the last uh, town meeting, the school pro approved the stretch code. And it's maybe moving towards green communities. And so, do we have any? I, hello, Chad. Do we have any? Uh, <laughs> do we think we may have any opportunity coming down the pipe for some of that money to? Because everything you're talking about is building envelope, HVAC, efficiency, sounds very green. What do we think? Sure. Some of the stretch code money, uh, green communities money, towards the project. That's a drop in the bucket to me because I need to find a stop. Yeah. And if, if this is the kind of thing that we, you know, move forward on, this then we make the request to the town, and then it, go, it goes to finance committee, and then goes to town meeting, eventually. Eventually, yep. Okay. So funding source gets identified, the town meeting gets asked for approval, and then funding sources. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Sure. I guess in the past there was the responsibility of the school or the finance committee to compare the capital budget with the depreciation expense that we would take in. Rather than waiting for these projects to, you know, building to be gone down, theoretically, if you have a capital budget, it should meet or exceed your depreciation expense on an annual basis. And who's doing that analysis? Yeah, it's a great question. That's, uh, I think that part of the problem is that analysis hasn't really been done prior to Chad's arrival. Um, so we're doing a little bit of backfill to kind of catch up. Um, but the goal is exactly what you described. We want to prevent Roderick from becoming like this. I think I think we're good. Thank you. That's the end of my report. Okay. Where are we? Uh, committee updates. Uh, that's reports. right. Yep, we're going right to committee reports. Um, Gray, you have a update. You yeah. had a KP meeting last week. So at the last KP meeting, we uh, got an update from Paul Zinni on that program I mentioned to you all a couple weeks ago. Uh, where potentially some high school students would be able to take some courses where they would then get college credit for by the time they graduate high school. Uh, so one of the concerns that they have with that program is that it's expensive and the students have to pay a significant amount. So they're trying to apply along with 11 other Massachusetts communities to get grants from the state so that the price would be much lower, so that that program is much more accessible to all students. He also mentioned that they were in talks with another program, similar, but um, with a program that would be that some of the students could be 
graduating as EFT with an EFT license. So that was pretty interesting. Uh, so he'll keep us updated on that. The assistant superintendent is the person who's going to be in charge of writing the uh, grant, is it grant proposal, grant request that was going to get submitted to the state is on behalf of the 11 communities. So thank you for that. They also have to hire a new, it was an assistant principal who had gotten hired at the middle school, um, left the position to come to KP. That school was able to get the candidate or the employee back, so they needed to hire a new assistant principal. The problem is it's in the middle of the year and it's difficult to find that kind of candidate. So they've actually changed the job, job description to Dean of Students. So that allows them to hire somebody who doesn't necessarily have the assistant principal qualifications. They also don't have to necessarily pay the same type of salary. The only difference between the dean of students and the assistant principal is that the dean of students can't evaluate teachers, which is fine. So the school can be kind of just discussed though, discussed though, how are they putting the job description out there? Are they also doing at the same time assistant principal while dean of students and whoever they can you know, hire, they hire. You know, they think it's just best to, at this point, hire the students and then in the summertime, review that candidate, whether they're going to search for another assistant principal or help the candidate or help the employee that's the students get the qualifications to then become the assistant principal. Am I making sense? Yes. Was that the middle school or high school? It's a, I believe it's the middle school. I'm pretty sure it's the middle school. Um, if it's not, I will correct that. So uh, I'll keep you updated on that, but. Um, they're coming up with uh, good ways to make sure that they can find a good candidate and adapt to the best candidate that we can find in the position. I'll let you know. Okay, so that's all. Okay, thank you. Uh, PTO. Yes, so the PTO, um, we've recently paid for another year of the book flip subscription for the entire district to use. Um, we also donated 30 children's t-shirts to the district's Project Mitten families. Um, we want to thank Aaron Blake for including us in that this year. Um, it's an amazing opportunity to help some families in town uh, with their Christmas. And we are holding a special staff-only spirit shop on Monday um, during lunch hours, so the staff can come down. We've had a lot of requests for shirts and sweatshirts. So they can come down during their lunch hours and purchase it in the Delaney lobby. Um, we're also going to be giving them a discount from what we usually do to thank them. Um, and our next meeting is right now is scheduled for January 11th at 7 o'clock. We have not figured out if it's going to be virtual or in person. We're kind of waiting after the holidays mm -hmm. to see how everything goes. Um, so we're hoping to have it in person. You had a good turnout, right? From, uh Yes. Yeah, we had one for the beginning of the school year, virtual. Yeah. Oh, and it was okay. a really good turnout. Good. Yeah. Good. A lot of interest. Great. Thanks for all that stuff. It's great. And the West update, uh, there was a West meeting, um, I forget when, last week, maybe? <laughs> Two weeks ago. Two weeks ago? Uh, and um, basically, the West update, Shining Stars, should be delivered um, in the next few days. Before, before the end of school next week, anyway, training stores will be delivered. And that's, uh, I think that's it. Do you know how many? I have no idea. I'm not the, on the receiving end of them this year. I usually do the data in the background, and I'm, I pass the torch. So I don't know. But I will know that for next month. OK, we have no need for executive session. Uh, I believe that's it, right? Yes. Yeah. So, um, what like somebody, motion, here we go. <laughs> Second. All those in favor? Aye. Okay. Aye. We have, um, the meeting is adjourned. The next meeting of the school committee will be on Tuesday, January 18th, 2022. The agenda will be posted and public participation information prior to the meeting. Thank you for coming. Thank you. You as well.